Peter Eels. He is the founder of the brilliant UK Butterflies website, and he's also the author of Life Cycles of British and Irish Butterflies, which you may have or know of. Um, he's also received the Marsh Award for the promotion of Lepidoptera conservation. And he's going to talk to us today about um, how you can use immature stages of butterfly to do add an extra aspect to recording. So he's here in the room with us now, so I'll hand over to him. He's already met. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation, especially to Zoe Randall at Butterfly Conservation. Um, this talk's um, slightly different. What I want to do is try and make you think about the potential for record, recording things we don't typically record and whether or not that would add any value. Um, this is some self-promotion. This is the book I wrote uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so let's get going. I'm conscious on between us and the break. Okay. There we go, right. Um, so recording immature stages. Well, with regard to butterflies and some moths, we already do this. So this is a butterfly called the brown hair streak. It's quite an elusive butterfly, um, flitters around hedgerows, easily mistaken for another species called the gatekeeper. But one of the things it does is it lays its very white eggs on very dark blackthorn bark uh, and overwinters as an egg. So this is actually one of the uh, techniques that is used for monitoring the brown hair streak. And in fact, it's been found in areas where the butterfly has never been seen because we found the eggs. Um, so this is a great example of recording uh, an immature stage of a butterfly. There are other examples, of course. Uh, one of the uh, things you can do is look for things that don't necessarily overwinter, but um, one, of the, one of the things that gets monitored by uh, Dan Hall and Martin Warren um, is, uh, you know, how the silver spotted skipper is faring. So it lays its eggs on sheep's fescue. And here you can see a continuous transect uh, up a hillside uh, where the quadrat is moved. Um, I think they go from bottom to top. Um, if it was me, I'd probably go from top to bottom. Um, but, you know, really looking in there to see how many uh, of these very conspicuous white eggs there are. Uh, and this, this uh, transect's been going on for quite some time, actually. So we can actually... Uh, uh, determine trends as a result. Um, some other species are, uh, are measured, but not based on their eggs, but based on their caterpillars, the larvae. Uh, so a good example is quite a, a, a rare and threatened species in Europe, the marsh fritillary. Um, the interesting thing about this species is that when the larvae um, go into hibernation and come out of hibernation, they form these dense clusters, um, which can be quite visible, especially um, some in the bottom right here. This is in the spring. Uh, early spring, uh, February may not be spring, but um, when they do come out of hibernation, they form these dense groups um, and the dark colouring of the caterpillar and the warmth of the sun is something that aids their digestion. So it gets the enzymes going, so they actually cluster together, temperature goes up uh, and they're more successful as a result. But it's a very easy way of actually monitoring the marsh fritillary. Uh, this is a site in, um, that I was uh, doing some monitoring in, and um, it's called North, uh, well, Bull Island, uh, just east of Dublin. By the way, I'm not a professional entomologist. I used to work in IT till I retired last month. Um, work took me everywhere and I was able to correlate the day job with interesting sites to go and visit, as you'll see. Uh, another example is the Glanville fritillary. Um, in um, Britain and Ireland, it's in the northern part of its range, so it's found on the south coast of the Isle of Wight, primarily. There are a few scattered colonies on, on the mainland. But again, it's the species that um, overwinters in these dense webs and larvae very easy to find when they, uh, when they uh, are basking in the sun. Um, they actually overwinter in these dense webs and I should have included a, a photo of waves crashing over the area where these dense webs are formed. I mean, they are so dense, they're like really compact tennis balls in the center of which contains the larvae. Uh, this is Compton Chine on the left on the uh, south coast of the Isle of Wight. So I've always been interested in butterflies, um, but there was a particular study that really caught my attention. Um, this one by uh, Hans van Dijk and colleagues in uh, uh, Belgium. And this is looking at the wall butterfly. And the interesting thing about the wall that you need to know is that it can only successfully overwinter as a third instar caterpillar. So it has four instars, 
So I'm sure you know what an instar is. It's like the skin. So when you come out of an egg, your first instar, skin chain, second instar, and so on. So in the north of its range, it goes through two complete broods, lays its eggs, caterpillars feed up, manage to get to their third instar and successfully overwinter. In the south of its range, so at the bottom of this slide, it can actually put in another, another brood. So it has a third brood, and again, the legs get aid, get laid, the caterpillars feed up and overwinter successfully in their third instar. Now, the hypothesis here is in the middle, you know, between those two um, uh, areas, between north and south, there, and this is a butterfly that's been in quite severe decline for some time, is that the butterfly is falling into a developmental trap. So a proportion of the second brood goes on to emerge as butterflies. If the butterflies are able to find a, a, a mate, then maybe eggs will get laid. If the weather's okay, then maybe the caterpillar will develop. But what we're seeing is this developmental trap where the conditions aren't suitable for the butterfly to get to its third instar. And therefore, this is a hypothesis that says this could be a reason with climate change for the butterfly starting to decline. Now, my question was, two questions, what does a wall caterpillar look like and how do I know it's in its third instar, which took me down this avenue, <laughs> uh, which led to the book being written, which I'll tell you about. So, the only source of descriptions of each of the larval instars, of each of the butterflies that I could come across, is this work that was published in 90, 20, 1924 by Frederick William Frohawk, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, an amazing naturalist, an amazing illustrator, and he produced this two volume masterpiece called Natural History of British Butterflies. Uh, it's got lovely plates in it, as you can see on the right here, this is the Purple Emperor. Um, but there are some drawbacks. And one of those drawbacks is he illustrated things at life size. So if you take this example of a plate for a butterfly called the Scotch Argus, Argus, and you look at the first instar caterpillar, it's pretty much a brown blob that looks very much like the second and third instar caterpillars and almost first instar caterpillars of every other species. So to compensate for that, he's got these very elaborate descriptions of what a first instar caterpillar looks like, uh, so as well as some behavioral things. So for example, you know, right at the top, um, the larva makes its exit by eating all around the crown or nearly so, rather low down, and then pushes up a lid and crawls out, the lid of the egg and crawls out. And then the description from then on is describing what the first instar caterpillar looks like. Now, I thought in this day and age, with what we can do with digital photography, could we improve on this masterpiece, this, this work? So here is a picture of the first instar Scotch Argus caterpillar that has eaten its way around the crown of the egg and has pushed the lid out and is crawling out. And when it's done that, this is what it looks like. So I had this crazy idea, well, what could we do this for all the instars and for all the species? But I needed help. Um, so as was mentioned, so I created a, a, a website, um, it's around about two, 2002 called UK Butterflies, which took on a life of its own. But there are lots of different contributors there. It, what I was trying to do is really develop a community that allowed people to, to contribute photos in a meaningful way um, and you know, actually use the data from the photos as well uh, for various reasons. One was identification, uh, one was to look at um, uh, thing, things like aberrations, which butterfly enthusiasts seem to be obsessed with. Uh, but other characteristics as well, you know, looking at particular features of a butterfly or a caterpillar or an egg or a chrysalis, things that were going to help people identify things. Um, so one of the contributors, not me, said, well, let's call it Frohawk 2.0. And I thought, well, that's a bit bold, uh, <laughs> but I just need to make clear that was nothing to do with me. So what was this project going to take? So, I, so let's um, make some assumptions. So first of all, there are 59 resident or regular migrant butterfly species in Britain and Ireland. That would be 236 stages that would need to be uh, observed and photographed and so on. So every butterfly has four stages, uh, of course. Then you'll have to take it from me that the number of larval instars is 293. So each species, I'll come on to um, the plasticity. So there's some variation in the number of instars in each species. 
But generally speaking, each species has a fixed number of instars. And if you add all those together, it's 293. So you end up with 470 subjects of interest. So yes, this took 20 years to pull together. So um, what I'll do is I'll give, give a couple of examples of what we needed to do. Um, first of all, I'll reassure you that no caterpillars were harmed in the making of this presentation, but using a vernier gauge to measure the length of a caterpillar is quite important. And also the size of the head capsule, which is fairly consistent, believe it or not. So you can use a micrometer like that. And no, you don't put the caterpillar's head between the two the two drawers, but you know, get it fairly close. But this was all useful information to help us determine which instar uh, a given caterpillar was in. Um, so what I did then was um, test the effectiveness of what I was starting to pull together. Um, and very luckily, um, I, I was doing a poster session at um, uh, a conference that Butterfly Conservation uh, holds every couple of years. And next to me was uh, Rachel Jones, who was doing a study on a butterfly called the Lulworth Skipper. And she was having to survey for the larvae. And I said, well, if I write up the first description for the Lulworth Skipper, would you be willing to test it out in the field? And yeah, she said, sure. So you can't see it, but what I sent her was a picture of a first instar Lulworth Skipper caterpillar, which happens to feed on tall grass. There is a correlation with food plant as well as appearance. And you can see the uh, caterpillar's got like this bright, uh, dark mark behind the, uh, behind the head. Uh, and down there, <laughs> where I circle, is a first install of uh, skipper caterpillar. So I got confirmation from Rachel that actually this was, um, yeah, heading in the right direction. Um, and then Martin Warren, who's the previous chief executive of uh, butterfly conservation, sent me four photos of other caterpillars that, um, that they'd found. So Martin was helping uh, Rachel with some of her work. And he said, what do you think they are? And rather than giving him an answer, I did this. Because, so the four candidate species, uh, which, which all feed on grasses were the Essex, Small, Lulworth and Large Skippers. Uh, they feed on different food plants, apart from large and Essex share coxfoot primarily. There are exceptions to this as well. And I essentially built this table. And I said, well, I'm not gonna tell you what I think they are. But here's a table for you. You tell me what you think they are, and then we'll compare notes. Uh, and we actually came to uh, a consensus on what those four caterpillars were, and they weren't all what were skippers. So I thought, oh, okay, this, this thing's got legs. There's a joke there somewhere, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, those, <laughs> but those caterpillars have. Right, so uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of some challenging species. Now, one of those is the checkered skipper butterfly, which at the time was only found in Northwest Scotland. So it's since been a reintroduction into Rockingham Forest. Um, so um, I mentioned my day job, which was uh, in, in IT essentially, and I uh, deliberately got myself a posting to Glasgow for three years <laughs> and spent all my days off going to Gl uh, Glasgow and Wood. But in the first year, uh, so this is Glasgow Wood, it's a national nature reserve. This is what the part of the reserve looks like. Um, this is ideal checkered skipper habitat. And the reason it's maintained as ideal checkered skipper habitat is because of this way leave. So it's actually managed for the power line that goes through, uh, through the wood. Um, but it's full of all of the things that the checkered skipper needs in terms of larval food plant, which is purple moor grass, uh, in terms of, um, uh, the ability to set up territories uh, for the males in terms of shelter, in terms of temperature, in terms of um, uh, humidity and all sorts of other factors. Um, so most people go to see the butterfly at the end of May, early June, when it's on the wing, um, uh, as did I. So at the end of May, uh, I, I like to tell people I came across this wonderful mating pair, which is quite a rare sight. Uh, what I actually saw initially, just to fess up, is this thing dangling underneath the fern, which was the male. Actually, it looks like the female holding, <laughs> this, with the male whose claspers is attached to her holding onto a fern. So I gently lifted them up and then got the photo on the left, because the one on the right isn't particularly uh, pleasing. Um, but one thing I also saw uh, on a subsequent visit were um, females egg laying on uh, the purple wall grass. Uh, so this is the egg, it's uh, laid sort of halfway up the sheath, uh, fairly bright white, so quite easy to see. But, you know, you can imagine in this um, 
uh, very large sites actually finding them. If you don't see the females laying, you'd have a bit of a struggle finding the eggs, to be frank. Um, so when I bumped into other visitors, I would always pick on them and say, if you see a female egg laying, do let me know and explain what I was up to, which uh, uh, was quite fruitful on a couple of occasions. Um, what not many, not many people, though, go to Glasgow and Wood outside of the flight season with the checkered skipper. And knowing that the larva had particular feeding damage, quite distinctive, uh, or causes quite distinctive feeding damage, I decided to uh, go to Glasgow and Wood in September. Uh, here's a tuft of purple mall grass. Um, the caterpillar actually needs purple mall grass that retains its nutrients long enough for the caterpillar to feed up uh, so that it can then hibernate. And when it re-emerges in the spring, it no longer, it doesn't eat anymore, but it pupates, which um, uh, is kind of relevant here. Um, so yeah, fairly misty, fairly horrible. Um, looking for this distinctive feeding damage, I've came across all sorts of weird things. Um, leaf hoppers, sawfly larvae, I drink them off the larva, all, all 12. Um, some of which gave me a heart attack when I'd find this feeding damage and think that it was a checkered skipper larva, but it wasn't. Um, and I was looking in the wrong area initially. Um, now, one of my um, key sources of inspiration was Neil Ravencross' PhD thesis, which was on the Checkered Skipper. Um, his study site was primarily a, a place called Ariundel Woodlands. But it's such a large site, it's much harder to find anything there, whereas Glasdrum is much more compact. Um, so what I did was move down to where the larval uh, the larval areas, which is further down the slope with uh, flushed soils and uh, some other clues in terms of scrub and the composition of that scrub. Um, and I started to find empty larval tubes where the caterpillars have previously fed. So, you can, so what the caterpillar does is it stays in the tube for protection and feeds both above and below the tube, as you can see on the left, and then moves to another grass blade and creates a new tube when uh, they finish munching on that. Uh, another good example on the right there, where you see this not, the notches either side of the grass blade. That's really what you're looking for. I sound such a nerd when I describe this. My <laughs> missus doesn't understand, but anyway, talk about my problems next, later on. <laughs> and then I came across this, which was actually two blades of grass that have been silked together, which is a good clue that there is a final instar checkered skipper larva in there. While I was setting up my camera, which I was putting on a tripod to take this photo, I accidentally knocked uh, another blade and I saw this thing start to crawl out backwards. I thought that's an interesting characteristic. So I tapped it a bit more and what reversed out of that blade was a final instar checkered skipper larva. Um, so that was the um, first time I came face to anal flap with a <laughs> checkered skipper caterpillar and that really made my day. Um, but what it told me was the potential of what, what could we do in terms of monitoring this. So, for the so I had a plan then, which was okay. Let's think about all of the sites I could go to. I've already kind of you know, there's the Ariundel Woodlands uh, to the west, the Ogmahuic, which is a BC a butterfly conservation reserve, uh, to the north, the area around Speenbridge, Glenloy, Glen Nevis. Uh, it, it's normally described as the area around Fort William, but you can see the extensive uh, distribution here. Um, to the south, you've got the uh, head of Lockett Eve, um, but in particular to the south, given that I was coming up from Glasgow, Glasgow Wood seemed the perfect place to continue this study. And again, because it was a fairly compact um, uh, site. Um, so what I did do uh, the following year was uh, I was able to follow the eggs through. Um, so you can, here you can see an egg starting to colour up as it's known. So it goes from uh, a bright white to a sort of pale orange. And on the right here, you can see the head of the caterpillar, um, you know, showing through the shell of the egg. Um, I managed to find a caterpillar emerging from its egg. So you can see it eating its eggshell. And the first instar caterpillar eat, uh, creating the tube in which it's going to live. Uh, I, I wish I had a video of this, but what the caterpillar does is it uh, threads silk each, uh, to, to each side of the grass blade. And it's sort of going like that at that speed. And then it moves on and it does it again. So you create these bands of silk. And as silk dries, it contracts. And that causes the blade to fold in on itself. And then you end up with a tube, a protective tube, within which the caterpillar uh, will reside when it's not feeding. And you end up with this kind of contract, uh, 
construction on the right there. Absolutely fascinating behavior. Um, and I followed uh, quite a few caterpillars actually through the different instars. So second, third, fourth instar, there's some differences in size, head capsule and appearance. So one of the things you can see is in the third and fourth instars, you've got this bell shaped marking on the, uh, on the rear end of the caterpillar, which isn't present in the earlier instars. So again, these were identification clues for others looking to uh, follow the species. Um, finally, regarding this particular story, you'll notice that the head of the caterpillar is black in all of its instars, but not in the final instar. So this is the final instar checkered skipper caterpillar on green, purple, more grass, and then it goes into hibernation. So it um, threads some leaves together that um, purple mole grass is a deciduous perennial, so it dies back over the winter before regrowing the following spring. Um, so you end up with, you know, you can see the, the grass starting to uh, change colour already when this photo was taken. I'll try to highlight where the hibernaculum is. So within that construction, the, the caterpillar sort of wraps itself uh, up in a, uh, almost like a, a mummified silk <laughs> uh, casing. Um, of course, that green caterpillar wouldn't do so well when it emerges in the spring. So this is a picture in early spring of Glasdrum wood. So you can see the green grass, purple moor grass is now like a hay meadow. You know, it's all dyed back and it's all, uh, you know, brown and what have you. The amazing thing about the checkered skip caterpillar is that when it re-emerges from hibernation, that green caterpillar now looks like this, which is an amazing evolutionary trick. So it's changed color to perfectly match the color of the dead purple moor grass leaves. Uh, again, absolutely fascinating. Um, this one's actually spinning up to, uh, to pupate. Um, and one thing I've got to mention, I'm not bragging, but when, when you, I, I think, I always tell people that the immature stages is where it's at. <laughs> and for me, it's, um, the reason is that uh, when I was, uh, uh, when I found one of these final instar larvae that was I was monitoring and I had tags down and all, all sorts of things to uh, relocate them. Um, I found some grubs crawling out of them. So some parasitoid had got in there. The grubs had eaten the inside of the caterpillar uh, and, uh, you know, basically come out of the caterpillar's skin. So I took them home and the flies emerged. I got them analysed and after seven years, the analysis has finally come around. So this is a species new to science. That little parasitoid. So welcome to the world, Cartesia carterocephali, which will be mentioned in the Entomologist's Gazette uh, in the next publication. So, uh, and then finally, um, I've never seen e even a photo of a checkered skipper chrysalis. So seeing one in, you know, face to face, as it were, uh, was quite a special experience. And on the right there, you can actually see the uh, uh, butterfly almost ready to emerge. Um, I so, so that particular butterfly was in that chrysalis for 42 days. I spent so many hours <laughs> looking, <laughs> waiting for the big event and never, yeah, I missed the big event basically. Anyway, next time. Um, but in terms of data, um, Frohawk, Frohawk actually reared checkered skippers in captivity and came up with some, uh, some data as did I. Uh, the only thing I'd say is there was actually quite a cro close correlation. I thought, how can this be? But um, the climate in that part of Scotland is, that, is not necessarily what you might think. Um, so it's actually, you know, got the Atlantic uh, effect there. But the point was, and this is, this is something I thought was, again, quite interesting, is that when you look at the phenology charts for all uh, Lepidoptera, they're kind of shown like this. So you see the adult followed by egg, followed by, you know, the larval stage, pupil stage was the ability to create something that was a little, little more detailed in terms of, well, if you were to overlay the different instars onto that, um, this is almost like a new dimension of recording. And, you, you know, I, I'm just putting it out there really because um, this is hard work, as you can probably gather. But, you know, what is the potential? If I go back to the wall brain, the, the wall example of, they can over successfully overwinter as a third instar caterpillar, well, could this kind of data for the wall actually help for different regions? And, you know, can we provide the tools to, uh, to people to actually uh, do the monitoring that would be needed 
to see what the effect of things like climate change is on this uh, particular butterfly. Um, the, the filled circles, by the way, are actual observate observations and the unfilled circles are other uh, observations from others uh, or derived from data in uh, other publications. So that was the checkered skipper story. <laughs> that was the hardest, uh, one of the hardest of uh, the, the species we covered. Another species which I'll just briefly mention is uh, a butterfly called the large blue, which you may have heard of. So it's caterpillar feeds on ant grubs. Um, fortunately, I was able to rear some of these in captivity. So, so essentially, they um, feed on the um, unopened flower buds of thyme, wild thyme and marjoram until they reach their final instar, and then they drop to the ground. And I'll show you what happens next. But this is one of the final instar caterpillars that I reared under license from uh, Natural England, I should mention, with the help of uh, Jeremy Thomas, Dave Simcox and Sarah Meredith, uh, the three amigos, as I call them. Uh, who've been responsible as a collective for uh, reintroducing the large blue following its ex extinction in uh, 1979. Um, Jeremy was the pioneer who discovered its reliance, uh, this species reliance on a particular species of an ant, Myrbica sabuliti. Um, so I call this particular chap Harry, I don't know why, but this is Harry and this is a, an ant grub that's uh, sorry, not an ant grub, an ant that is uh, taking an interest in him um, before he got picked up and taken off, uh, which I'll, I'll show you some better photos in a, in a moment. And uh, Dave and Sarah won uh, UK Butterflies every year, gives an award to individuals that have uh, gone above and beyond. So uh, they got the, the award that year. But the sequence is pretty much this. So first of all, um, the, the caterpillar itself has some interesting... Um, devices on its body to attract ants. Um, one of those key things is um, the fact that it secretes the sugary solution that the ants then, um, you know, it's full of amino acids and what have you, that can, you know, feed ant grubs. So that obviously the, uh, an ant would take an interest in that. Um, what the grub then, sorry, what the ant, <laughs> what the caterpillar then does is it rears up on its hind legs and puffs the front of its body up. So it's an amazing photo from Jeremy. And this fools the ant into thinking that it's an ant grub that has somehow left the nest. It then picks up the caterpillar in its jaws. And this is actually really, I spent about 35 minutes watching Harry. It got picked up and then it went to, you know, ran off in about two seconds. But anyway, uh, this is a caterpillar being picked up, gets taken back to uh, the, the, the brood where it then feeds on ant grubs. Uh, primarily. Uh, and the most amazing photo of a large blue that I've ever seen, every, everyone thinks it's going to be a picture of a butterfly, but it's not, it's this. This is a final instar large blue caterpillar eating an ant grub taken by Marcin Silesnio, who uh, is at a university in Poland. So amazing, amazing photo. How are we doing? Okay, let me rattle through a few, few more. Um, and then, of course, the, I say of course, and then the caterpillar pupates inside the ant nest. Uh, here you can see the uh, fully formed butterfly uh, inside the chrysalis, and it ultimately emerges and uh, uh, takes flight. So that was another tricky subject which we managed to cover off. Um, all the others were relatively easy compared to those two. Um, I just thought I'd uh, finish up with just, just things to be aware of, some of the challenges when you're looking for some of the different immature stages of uh, uh, the butterflies of Britain and Ireland. One is the change in colour that you see in um, some, of, some of the different stages. So the orange tip butterfly, which you will have noticed in uh, country lanes and uh, gardens already. So the male has fairly distinctive orange tips, whereas the female uh, lacks those tips. But when it lays its eggs, they are white. And over a period of a couple of days, they turn bright orange. Um, what you need to remember about the orange tip caterpillar is that it's cannibalistic. And it's thought that that is a device to ensure that the caterpillar doesn't outstrip the supply of food plant. And it's thought that the reason that the egg is orange, once it's colored up, is to alert a female orange tip to the fact that there's already an egg on that plant and to go somewhere else. Um, although that doesn't always work. So I want to find a, a cuckoo flower plant. They lay on garlic mustard as well, but a cuckoo flower plant with 21 eggs on it. So uh, Darwin in action there, I guess, one big fat caterpillar. 
Um, the same effect happens in the butterfly called the dingy skipper, but its caterpillar is not cannibalistic. So why that happens? It could be, again, just to alert the females to the fact that there's an egg there and you don't want to outstrip the supply of food part. Um, there's variation in caterpillars, so there are different colour forms of some species. So this is a marbled white, um, very easy, well, very easy. They're the right kind of sites. They're quite easy to find um, at uh, dusk. So as the light's starting to fade, then the caterpillars will actually come up the grass blades uh, and they're quite visible uh, with, the, with the torch, whereas they're hunkered down at the base of the grass tuss tussock uh, during the day. Um, and again, it's thought that, you know, why are there two forms? Well, it could be to, um, you know, vanadium predator, the bird locks into a particular search image that you're kind of spreading the risk. So if it's looking for bright green caterpillars, well, we won't find the brown variety and all of that kind of uh, thinking. And there's variation in pupae or chrysalises as well. So this is a butterfly called the black hair streak, and there's both a brown form of the chrysalis and a black form. Um, and it's designed to look like a bird dropping. So hopefully that will deter birds from wanting to uh, gobble it up. Um, other challenges, things that are camouflage. So I showed you the brown hair streak white egg right at the start on black form. The black hair streak egg is brown, so therefore much harder to find when you've got a brown egg on a brown, brown stem. Um, and on the right here, you have a white letter hair streak caterpillar on flowering elm, if you can see it. So it's just there. <laughs> I'm sure there's a pointer on here, but in the bottom right, there's actually a caterpillar. So, uh, and, and again, you know, including all of these, getting all this information out there for people to locate these different immature stages was uh, an important consideration for us. You need to be aware of things that might be hidden. So on the far left there, you've got the butterfly called the small skipper that lays its eggs in the sheath of different uh, types of grass. The female will actually land on the grass stand, sort of spiral down it, uh, all the time probing the sheath opening for a suitable place to lay her eggs. And then she'll put her ovipositor into the sheath and I was gonna say blast out, sounds like a machine gun, but lay, lay eggs in the sheath and then the sheath closes up. So the only way to find them is to find an egg laying small skipper female. Uh, in the middle, you've got a butterfly called the small, it's our smallest British butterfly, a uh, small blue. Um, and what the caterpillar does once it hatches from the egg uh, in its early instars is it burrows into the kidney vetch florets. So it's, the eggs are laid on kidney vetch. And you can just see a little hole in uh, the floret uh, towards the top of the, the photo. And the dark area that you can see just below that is the caterpillar inside the kidney vetch floret. Did I say I'm obsessed? Anyway, <laughs> and on the far right, uh, checkered skipper uh, caterpillar, as we mentioned. Uh, and chrysalises will also um, be squirreled away somewhere. That's a poor phrase, isn't it? Hidden. Uh, so on the left, you've got a grizzled skipper pupa, which overwinters as a chrysalis. Um, this is um, uh, in the leaves of uh, wild strawberry, by the looks of it. Uh, and on the right, a butterfly called the grayling, which has a very moth-like tendency of actually burrowing a little way under the surface of the soil, um, creating a small chamber with, uh, and it will spin silk to uh, attach um, uh, some of the earth particles together and then pupate underground. So again, this can really, you know, a photo of a grayling chrysalis can only be done by rearing them in captivity. Um, so a lot of the, or, or quite a few of the subjects that are, are covered in the book. Uh, were, you know, the photos were achieved through captive rearing. Uh, and then finally, things that appear at night. So we talked about the marbled white, uh, that's a meadow brown caterpillar. These things on the right are uh, Duke of Burgundy caterpillars, which feed on different types of primula. Um, and they're quite easy to find the feeding damage, but again, they go down to the base of the plant at night. Um, so you need to get out there with a the torch if you want to find the, the larvae. Uh, two more minutes. We've discovered a few things along the way. There was some debate about how many larval instars uh, different species have. So we know that in the common eye, there always has five instars. The mountain ringlet has got six larval instars. Frohawk said there were four. Most people say there are five. I think there are six. And um, if you want to find out why, then um, buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding if you want to know, just come along.
Um, one of the other things we discovered was um, something called larval plasticity. So most species will have a fixed number of instars that the caterpillars go through. Um, but there are some conditions under which um, uh, a caterpillar will put in an extra instar. So um, glandular fertility, if the caterpillar is underdeveloped, then it will go through eight rather than seven instars. Um, similarly with red admiral we'll go through six and speckle wood this is an interesting one which we found in research we didn't discover this ourselves that it, it will go through five rather than four in stars if the caterpillar is female and is developing in cool conditions which is quite specific but also pretty interesting um, uh, yeah we discovered some other things one of the things that uh, I find really interesting is that when you have caterpillars which have got a kind of plain and transparent skin, so this wouldn't work with hairy caterpillars, um, is that you can determine whether it's not it's male or female, because in male caterpillars, you can see the developing testes through the caterpillar skin. So if I just take the, you know, if I were to do a test and say, which, you know, what sex is this caterpillar? <laughs> Um, the reason is you can start to see these marks and therefore the, uh, the resulting butterfly will be male. Um, so again, just an interesting thing I thought I'd throw in there. Um, so just to wrap up, yeah, so, so uh, I don't really know what the potential is for the use of this kind of information. All I know is that by studying immature stages, especially, I, I, I do think it's a new dimension. Uh, to the recording of butterflies. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how it can be put to good use because it does take an awful lot of effort to look at all of the larval instars, especially. But um, some obvious things that we can measure, you know, changes in phenology, maybe as a result of uh, climate change, uh, distribution and population trends, which can then infer things like habitat suitability, habitat management um, suit effectiveness, uh, and then the impact of climate change as well. And, and I will wrap up. I thought Will Langdon might be here, but he's not, but I'll mention him anyway, is that in, regarding the impact of climate change, there's a butterfly called the large tortoise shell that became extinct, we think, in Britain. Um, a couple of years ago, Will, who is a student here, he's doing his PhD at Oxford, uh, found what we thought were the remains of larval webs. So there were larval skins in there. And then yesterday, uh, yesterday last year, we went down to the Isle of Portland and looked at every elm on the island for seven hours. And we found some large tortoiseshell caterpillars, which proves that they are back and breeding. So there have been the, the occasional sighting, but this was actually quite a moment for us. Make it sound like we gave each other a hug or something, but yeah, <laughs> this, is a, this is a big deal for butterfly fanatics. So, um, so, it, so again, you know, uh, we can start to make these kinds of discovery uh, through, you know, by taking an interest in uh, the immature stages of uh, British and Irish butterflies. Um, I mentioned, you know, I won't mention the book on the left. There's also a very good book on the, the right that has um, uh, illustrations by Richard Lewington, who's a very well-known illustrator of all of the final instar caterpillars of uh, both butterflies and moths. So what I always say is there's no excuses for going, not going out there and uh, trying to use the information captured in these two, uh, two books. And that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you, it was brilliant. Um, it's always good to hear about really high quality field work like that. And also to be able to communicate with people is very important as well. So oh, thank you very much. Double thumbs up from me. Thank you. Um, so uh, we've got a few minutes now, so we'll take any questions. Have we got any in the room? Or glass with information. Coffee awaits. <laughs> oh yeah, so we've got one in the room. When are you going to move up to spots? <laughs> <laughs> Um, for anybody online, that was when we're going to do the box stand. Yeah, I, I have been asked that. So the 59 species of butterfly versus the 2,500 species of it. So um, yeah, I'll leave that to a young, another generation, I think. <laughs> There's a task force due to Some people are doing this, though, with um, certain groups, families and so on, especially leaf mining moths, interestingly, which aren't the biggest in the world. But, um, so, uh, have we got any questions online? Oh, it's all done. Out there in the ether. 
Um, yeah, hi, I'm here. <laughs> um, super. Uh, we haven't got any questions. We've got loads of comments basically saying how amazing this is. And there's lots of really good natural history resources and information there, and which is super. Um, also, the photos are phenomenal. So, yeah, amazing. Um, everyone's saying it in the chat, massive kudos. Um, Sue Taylor is asking, um, are you as good at this as your day job? <laughs> so, uh, it just shows that you're amazing at, at doing this. So, yeah, super. But no, no questions from us. Funnily enough, one of the reasons for retiring was to do more of this. <laughs> I'd rather do this than do anything in IT. So, yeah, is there a... oh, more questions in the room? The By the way, this is a final in-star White Admiral caterpillar. Um, um, I think um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, just for people online, um, they're just asking if there's any excuses for sitting in bushes that you can use. Apart from telling people to mind their own business and, um, uh, yeah, the most difficult one is with the wife, but um, <laughs> yeah, it takes me back to when I first saw um, uh, the Chalk Hill Blue caterpillar was nocturnal. Uh, was the image of myself and a friend of mine called Tim Norris on our hands and knees with torches, look, looking down over, you know, just waiting for an officer to come up and say, you know, <laughs> excuse me, sir, would you explain what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. So no, I don't have any, any excuses. So. Yeah, I'll just carry on regardless anyway. They just think I'm nuts. <laughs> just make some squeals or something, do something weird. Uh, any more in the room? Yeah, one from Tree is that? Hi. Uh, so, I've got this right. You set up a website. Yep. You obviously had your own passion. You managed to find other people to yep. help you with it. Um, so, you're a very special person to do both of those things. So, just one minute. <laughs> I think it's definitely the people thing. So when I set up the website, it was actually a personal website, just had some of my photos on. And then um, uh, at some point I added a forum and a few, you know, I encouraged a few of my friends to join the forum. We started having discussions. It was all publicly visible and other people who we'd never met would join. Um, for quite a few years, we, well, we, we would actually attend shows as well. So we want pleading to different organizations to sell us books at a discount. So we have a stand where we would then talk to people and tell them about the website. Um, we would run events. We had photography workshops for about 10 years. And again, you, they were always oversubscribed. We would limit it to 50 people. And you know, we'd have like 150 people who'd want to come. They were all opportunities to connect with people um, and get them beyond the photography bit. That's what, I, that's what my personal mission was, was because I started, I, was, I suppose, partly there, was, uh, okay, I, I just like taking photographs, but what do you do after that? You've photographed everything, after you've seen every, every butterfly. Well, that's where the ecology stuff starts to kick in. And that's what I was really trying to encourage in others, was to take a deeper interest. And that really has taken off. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a magic ingredient. I mean, having a, a website have been able to communicate both through social media as well as um, face to face is obviously important. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I wish I knew. I'll probably bottle it. And <laughs> does, I know. I know some societies have a, uh, a real challenge with getting new members, getting people to contribute. So, um, so I'm part. Uh, uh, I'm on the committee of as of yesterday actually of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight branch of butterfly conservation. I used to be a chairman years ago, and uh, it's always been a struggle finding people to do, not, not just to study, but actually support the branch activities, like finding a treasurer, is it possible? Anyway, <laughs> so I don't know if there's a magic ingredient, and um, yeah, I don't know, maybe it's something we'll discuss during the course of the day. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we've got one minute to the coffee break. I did want to say, don't worry about to be a nerd in front of the NFDR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so you're my kind of people. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so